Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, first and foremost, I appreciate your time, but even more important than your time, I appreciate your priority for this. Time is something that as salespeople we never get back, and learning how to prioritize the activities within the time that we have is critically important. So again, thank you for both of those. Jim Frizee, DX Continuum. We are a provider of software as a service. It is based in predictive analytics or advanced analytics. The beauty of it is, is that's not for you guys to know and master, it's for us. If you have a data science group, they'll appreciate what we do, be able to bless kind of our approach, our algorithms, all of that, but it's making something that's very complex and sophisticated simple for the end user, the salesperson, because keep it simple for the salesperson has kind of been a motto that I've loved ever since I started selling. So for today's agenda, I wanna just do a little bit about cross-industry predictive trends and challenges predictive analytics and the value proposition for the sales line of business in particular. An homage to my heroes of technology and data science. I lovingly refer to them as Seymour and Eager. And we'll talk a little bit about those two gentlemen that are brilliant. And then predictive software as a service for sales solution considerations. And last, how to engage vendors offering predictive capabilities, which is uh, usually a good point of interest for most of the folks I speak with. Here's a little bit about my background. I've been in analytics for over a decade. I've uh, worked with embedding reporting solutions and other software. I was uh, the 12th person at Burst, which is a BI as a service company. I ran inside sales for the Americas for KXEN, which was a darling of the analyst's predictive community and our customers, so much so we were acquired by SAP. And their product is now the lead of the automated analytics from SAP. So there's a lot of goodness there. And now I'm pleased to be VP of Sales at DX Continuum. And I'll tell a little bit about the journey, how I got there, and why. Um, coming out of SAP, I ran the global predictive organization in North America across SAP's strategic customer program. A really wonderful big job, exciting, brilliant people that you get to meet and work with but very much laboratory predictive use cases. And what I mean by laboratory predictive use cases, and a good crude example to give is, if you have one monkey and one $5 billion rocket, and you get one shot to send it up and bring it back down alive, you want to do it precisely. You want to get it right the first time, because you only have one shot. That is laboratory predictive. It is always going to require a data scientist, a statistics package, a lot of hand combing through data, and that is the traditional sort of paradigm for data science. And that's what most people are familiar with. Recently, though, in the last three to five years, there's been sort of a coming of age within the analytics industry. It's not just about BI anymore. It's not just about visualizing your data. It's about understanding what's going to happen next, what's the best thing that could happen, and how can I align myself to do things to get me to that next best thing that's going to happen. And that's really where DX Continuum came about, uh, as well as many of the other companies in our space. So this is some Salesforce data about objectives and things like that. The only couple things I want to show on this eye chart are the top objectives. You know, obviously everybody in the room is probably looking to acquire new customers, grow the value of their existing customers, deepen those relationships, and drive more revenue from it. And the metrics that we use to identify how we're benchmarking against those are new revenue, new customers, and recurring revenue. I think that's probably true of just about everybody in the room. And this wonderful eye chart tells you about what's working. So if you look, sales analytics and predictive analytics bring about a three and a half to four times improvement in production for people that are already effectively utilizing these technologies. So where do they come from? How did other people get started? What are some of the challenges? What do we address? Our solutions believe that you need to be a pure play predictive vendor across the board. A point solution is great, and it solves any one challenge. But what you're looking for is something that from onboarding through SDR, ISR, AE, manager, director, and executive has value for everybody. You know, you don't have to turn the switch and big bang it and give everybody predictive insight to drive the business. So you want to choose what aligns best to your goals, your production goals, your strategic goals. And so this is just a bit of information about some of the challenges that we've seen in our travels. 
how do I reduce the ramp up time of my new reps and start producing? Am I investing cycles in the right leads and opportunities? These are all the questions that we hear from sales reps, sales managers, finance, and IT. They're very indicative about just about everybody that we come across is curious about what can I do with this, but I don't understand where to begin or how to go about it. Because frankly, salespeople, we're used to selling. We're not used to evaluating or buying things too much too well. And if there's not much lifting involved for our IT or our analyst or data science community, then we kind of feel a little bit naked out there being asked to evaluate and buy a technology. So, this chart is where Gartner says bets are best place for increasing efficiency and effectiveness. And if you look like any quadrant, you want to be in the upper right-hand corner. And what they're saying is opportunity-based predictive analytics, price optimization, CPQ, guided selling, all of these are real core areas where you can gain some very rapid competitive and even strategic advantage. And you can do so with predictive. So what's in it? Who does it unlock value for? Well, here's four basic areas similar to what you saw before, and some of these are based on use cases that we've successfully proven out with our customers, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. I can name names, I think. And this deck will be available afterward. I'm going to try and get through it quickly so that you guys can ask questions as well, because I love presentations, but I love answers to direct questions even more. So an homage to my heroes. Seymour is actually not the name Seymour. It's actually my description of every brilliant person I've ever met in IT. And it's because they always want to take your technology apart, understand how it works, and see how they can apply it elsewhere. They want to see more. And frankly, with software as a service, there's not much involved for them. So it frustrates them because they want to deliver against the needs and requirements of the business. And eager there, and I met a ton of data scientists in my time. I'm pretty sure there aren't many in the room. Eager's not the stereotypical Russian data scientist that lives in his mom's basement, doesn't go out by sunlight, and has never kissed a girl. I've met him, really nice fellow, but this isn't who I'm talking about. Eager is the data scientist who is absolutely adamant. He can build any predictive model your business needs. And I don't argue with him, he's right. He can do it, and he can do it really well. The challenge for Eager and Seymour is time. The needs and changes in the requirements that drive the sales line of business happen rapidly, not only from within, but externally as well. And all of that pressure and the patterns or signals that it represents lives within your data. A lot of that data is in CRM, some of it's in ERP, book transactions, some of it comes out of marketing automation and things like that. But all of these effects on your business live within your data. The challenge is, is the solution or the team that you have on it nimble and agile enough to make the changes in real time so that the intelligence from the signals and patterns that you're lifting can be presented to the frontline agent to act on? That is immensely powerful. And the problem with traditional data science is that's not built into their approach. They are laboratory. So they are shooting the monkey into space, whether they like it or not. And frankly, when you ask Eager to optimize a sales effort or a marketing campaign, it's kind of beneath his pay grade. And he's offended by it, because he'd rather be working on something laboratory. I think if you were to ask any sales leader in the room, hey, can you wrap bubble gum for me for 30 days? They'd be screaming for a door after two trying to get out. And it's the same thing you're doing to a data scientist in your organization if you're putting them on the wrong sort of use case to match their education, their training, their skills, their art, if you will. It's not just a science to them. It's an art. And again, I recognize and appreciate that as much as anyone. Eager and Seymour are necessary whenever you're talking laboratory predictive. But when you're talking operational predictive, their time has come and gone. This is about the convergence of big data, machine learning, predictive analytics, software as a service, business process knowledge, and the integration of all of that. We look to our frontline sales agents to master this as quickly as possible so they can ramp up and become productive, but we haven't made it easier for them to manage that marriage of information, to become those experts that we expect of them, because each SDR, ISR, AE, whatever, serves as the tip of the spear for your organization. The more credible they are, the more confident they are, the more poised they are, the better the relationship begins and travels. And 
empowering them with the knowledge to have a meaningful conversation, understanding the talking points and why, those drivers, the predictive surfaces, those are all very important. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So cross-industry challenges and benefits. It used to be that when it was just the traditional craftsman approach to data science, you had the issues of, do I have an army of data scientists at my exposal, disposal? And those are not inexpensive resources, and they're not resources you want sitting on a bench for any duration of time based on the cost for them. How much data do I have? Can I manage it? There's a lot of big promises and very little documented ROI with a lot of these initiatives. There's really long, painful, expensive deployments, and people look back in the rear of your mirror and they can't understand why. It's because they didn't engage correctly. Is it operational versus laboratory? Are they going to build it versus buy it? Which one makes more sense? Is it a tools and platform approach, or am I looking for apps? Because frankly, if I don't have the sophistication in my own resources and headcount, it, it, I just made the decision for myself. I need to dip my toes into the beauty and benefits of predictive, but without having to have the software, the hardware, the headcount to staff it up and to drive it. Better, no better place to do that than sales, by the way. And then implementation, training, and adoption. How, how, how good am I at rolling this out and getting people to be able to embrace and, and utilize it? That's going to determine the success of any initiative that's technology-based. So what should the solution look like? We believe that it should be an off-the-shelf, out-of-the-box app that is simple plug-and-play, that there's no customization, there's only light data identification and mapping involved, that it's all about the ease of use and in your favorite sales cloud UI. I think I'll probably a lot of people are thinking Salesforce. It tends to be a very popular choice. They're ubiquitous at almost. But it could be Oracle. It could be almost anything else. And if you don't have the UI that a vendor has, that doesn't necessarily make you dead in the water. But it just makes closing the loop on the analysis and getting it to the frontline agent more challenging. So then continuous performance monitoring. And that's not only of the underlying model that's giving you the insights, but it's also of the people that are using them. And how can you use that for coaching and mentoring? I've heard a lot of high performance kind of coaching and mentoring themes throughout the day so far. And this is really something that can help support that and provide the information foundation that allows you to have that coaching and mentoring time. And last but not least, it has to be business user focused. It does no good to serve anybody's interest but the frontline sales user. At the end of the day, he's the one, she's the one that's going to go out and win the deal, win the revenue, deepen the relationship. So it's their needs that you need to be focused on. And what are the benefits? This is what we've seen. And some of these are conservative early returns. I'll talk about a couple more customer examples. A 25% increase in revenue. We've accomplished that working on one KPI. Maybe it's lead scoring, maybe it's opportunity scoring, maybe it's price prediction around what price will the opportunity eventually close at. That's a really powerful use case because if you can predict with 85% better accuracy what a deal will close at before the quarter begins, now you can send your team off to get concessions on pricing and T's and C's early so that they're armed and they can negotiate with a point of confidence back, giving up small bits of ground toward that ultimate fallback point. So you're not leaving money on the table as the quarter goes on because people are dropping price just to book a transaction. There's all kinds of use cases for the way predictive works. And instead of shoehorning you into what we believe your use case should be, we're far more consultative in that regard. We want to know what is it you're working on, because our ability to influence that metric, leveraging the information in your data, is what you should be curious about. Not that we're trying to fit you into something that we have designed that we think is going to be good for your business. 30% increase in wins, 20% increase in wallet share, and the last one makes me sound like Salesforce there. Cloud, no software, no hardware. And it's about time to value. I mean, this should be measured in days and weeks, never months and years. If you're doing operational predictive, it's fast. That's why it's operational. If you're doing laboratory, expect to spend more time and money. So those are just some of the things that we've seen in talking with people. Here's some of the customers that we've already worked with. We went out and we chose some really big, hairy, audacious goals. You know, if you're looking at cross-sell, upsell analysis, who better to go with than Cisco? 
148, 49 operating companies under the umbrella, very large families of products, not just hardware, but even support and services, other things that go out indirectly through channels unattached that leave off their most profitable SKUs. They need to fix that fast, and we help them to do that, and we can explain more about that. For Adobe, masters of marketing, people that can generate a lead second to none, it's the difference between what's an MQL and what's an SQL. Think about that for a second. Marketing and sales are in it together, and they're driving for the same thing, more customers, more revenue, better relationships, more sales. But at the end of the day, marketing is tasked with delivering MQLs, which fit one definition, and sales then is tasked with transforming those MQLs into SQLs. The traditional paradigm, again, says treat all of them and push them forward, kind of like Sisyphus does with the boulder every day. We take a different approach. We say, let's lift out the goodness, the 15% of those leads that hold the majority of the revenue this quarter. Let's put propensities on those that prioritize them up in your frontline agent's days. The faster they focus on the better opportunities, the quicker those transactions come, the larger and more consultative the process can be and the bigger bills of material they get. Also, the faster an SDR ramps up. If you give him insights that make him or her successful quicker, that confidence, that credibility, that poise goes right into the next conversation and everyone after that. So when people talk about how do I get people ramped up successfully, make, make them successful. Make it easier. Abbreviate the path. And you're going to see a lot better production out of them. And when the new guys start using it, it's infectious. The old guys that are reluctant to change, they know how this is done. All of a sudden, they're like, he's getting larger checks than me next month. This isn't right. I need to learn how to use this. VMware was a very interesting use case. They do tons of indirect business. And for them, it was about, we have so many new products that we introduce to our channels. We need to understand, when is that going to muddy the water with that particular channel member? When is it going to distract them from the amount of business that they already do with us? So it's going to hurt their business and hurt our business. We need to understand that up front. So when we're going to introduce a new product, we need your predictive insights to tell us, within the thousands of options of partners, who are the best ones? Who are going to take this and run with it and make it part of their practice and grow a successful revenue generating business? And who's going to use it and it's going to distract them and just create noise? We want to know that up front so that we can place our bets effectively. Those are some of the use cases that we work on with those customers. And again, I'd love if you have questions around your own use cases. Don't feel like you have to throw dirty laundry in the street. Everyone's data is imperfect, first of all. There is no such thing as a perfect data set, so that's usually one of the concerns people have immediately. Fortunately, the intersection of technologies that I spoke about earlier means that we work with much wider data sets these days, so perfect data isn't a requirement anymore. A lot of people are surprised to hear that. So this is the sales funnel, and MarTech is pretty much all in that prospecting area for the, for the most part. At least that's our view of it. Because, again, they're tasked with delivering MQLs. Where we live and breathe is lead scoring, opportunity scoring, pricing prediction, and then renewal, upsell, and cross-sell. To us, this is the sales journey for the customer, the customer's buying experience. And you need to be able to deliver value with your solutions to each of the stakeholders along the way in addition to the customer. The customer receives value because you're speaking their language. You're, you're, you're talking to them about what they care about and you're helping them to build the right bill of materials, the right, right vendor relationship, what have you. Um, but the frontline agent, they're looking for how do I quickly identify, prioritize my best activity? What am I going for in that? What's my commitment objective? How fast can I achieve that? Book the revenue, transact the deal, move on to the next one. Because when they do that, it creates a vacuum. Whether it's treating leads, it creates a vacuum at the front of the leads funnel, which gets more of the top rated leads treated through. If they're working on their opportunities and they're able to retire those to successful close earlier in the quarter, the same vacuum occurs. And all of a sudden, they're working at a larger scale than they used to. So not only does it drive the frequency of the deal, it drives the severity or the size of it. And the transactions pick up velocity. It's something that tends to be quite a shock to the culture, but a positive one. A CEO once asked me, Jim, what does this predictive do for me? And I said, well, it, it delivers great net new revenue. Well, that's great for my sales leader, but what does it do for me? 
Well, it capitalizes on all the investments you've made in marketing and gives you greater ROI on this. That's great for marketing. But what does it do for me? I said it shifts your culture. It's a culture mover. You are now going to be a data-driven sales culture. And the infectious nature of that's going to pervade throughout your entire organization. Now you've hit what matters to me, Jim. I'm a CEO. Talk to me about this culture shift. If everybody starts winning faster, bigger, and more often, what do you think that's going to do as people chat about that through the organization? It's amazing what that does. It lifts everybody. All the boats lift with the rising tide. And we've seen that time and again, not just in the company, but even within the particular line of business. Another good story is someone asked me, well, how can this influence my ability to take people to club? And this was kind of a funny one, because I asked, have you ever taken your entire team to club? Well, gosh, no. It's only for top performers that are 115% above their goal, or 15% above 100 of their goal. And I said, well, you get one shot to do this, because pretty soon after we implement and go live and your guys start using it and really driving value, your CFO is going to notice. <laughs> and next year, he's going to change your goals, because your production is going to be a lot higher. But this is the one year where if we work together early, you can actually take everybody to club. Because as long as they're willing to leverage the insights that you put in front of them, their effectiveness, their efficiency are going to gain leaps and bounds. And we saw this with Adobe in particular. Our, our promise to them, the, the success criteria, if you will, was that we would be able to reduce the number of leads that they contacted and increase their conversion and acceptance of opportunity ratio. And what we found was they were able to generate 75,000 raw leads a month for this individual business unit that we were going to support. That's a huge amount of leads. They had the scale through headcount to treat 2,000 of the 75,000 they were creating. Where do they begin is the big question. Through all of their marketing automation, the heuristics, the rules-based scoring, and all of that, they boiled 75,000 leads down into 10,000 MQLs. That's a big quality jump there. But 10,000 was still five times as many as the 2,000 they could contact. So they asked us to analyze, again, the drivers of booked revenue and success. We did that. We applied it back. And we said, hey, you know what? Out of these 10,000, 5,000 do not meet the criteria that you've defined for an SQL. So immediately, we cut those off and we sent those back to marketing for more education and nurturing, because that's where they needed to be. It was noise in the machine for the sales organization. With the 5,000 that were left, we prioritized those based on the predictions. Because again, the prediction is only the means by, with, by which you can prioritize and understand the signal or the pattern within the data that's being represented. That prioritization allowed them to lift their conversion ratio significantly. Initially, within short time after the deployment, I think three months, they were calling half as many leads, making twice as many conversions, and they said, hey, this is a big win. It meets our criteria. It's four to one. What we've recently discovered is it's much more dramatic than that. They have not only bettered those numbers since the initial deployment, but now their bills of material because they're focusing on those quality opportunities earlier in the quarter, they're far more consultative with each and every interaction because they know they're looking at the best ones. And those bills of material are now more than an order of magnitude greater than they used to be. So if they sold a $1,000 transaction, they're now selling a $10,000 transaction. Uh, 10000 became 100000 It is such huge revenue traction for them that they're blown away. So we're going to be doing a lot more work with them in a lot of different areas around their KPIs. But this kind of illustrates my point. When you're talking to someone, talk about what matters to you. Talk about what you're trying to accomplish and solve rather than what the vendor's doing. If the vendor just keeps coming back and telling you what they want you to do, you might need to talk to somebody else. So on that note, how do I suggest that people engage a predictive vendor? Well, it begins with an introductory executive chat. And this is just basic pre-qualification. I'll often hop on with a CRO, CSO, head of sales, and we'll just make sure that we're the kind of people that we want to talk to or do business with, that we want to put our teams together. It's a quick 15-minute call. And we see, hey, does this pique your interest? And do you think there's value in here for you? If there is, let's move on to a next step. We'll book some time. And that's a shared learning session where we mutually qualify one another. Yeah. 
they appear to know what they're talking about. Because uh, we've had a lot of people come in and talk to us about this, but these guys sound very credible and their process seems reasonable. So at the end of the shared learning session, come out with a use case, something that you guys are going to collaborate on, something that you can move the needle on. And then once you've identified that use case, quantify it. It's got to have enough value for you to transact on as well as the vendor. And if it's not there, you want to know sooner than later. So once you qualify what the challenge or opportunity is you're going to work on, quantify it every single time. Because at the end of the day, if it's not valuable enough, everyone will have wasted time. From there, you go on to creating a business case. That, that quantification of the shared opportunity or problem becomes a business case where the success criteria for it, it's collaborative. You will define what success for you looks like. And you're going to hold their feet to the fire for that standard. At least I hope you do. Uh, from there, you go into a proof of value. Now, there's a couple ways that we do this that I think are fantastic. Because again, time is always of the essence for sales. A historic proof is more than valid. And what we do, or what someone should do, is take 10 quarters of your data and be able to model and show you what their predictions, recommendations, insights, whatever challenge you're looking to address, what it would have been for the ninth quarter. Because you've got the data points in your history. You can go in and compare what did they say we should do and what we'd get out of it versus what did we do. And if it's not enough value, challenge them to come back and use the tenth. Because sometimes, again, we don't believe in throwing data at the problem just for the sake of throwing data at it. We're not consultants that are paid by the terabyte. Um, so there could be some tweaking to the underlying models to make them more powerful, more robust, and we're going to be interested to have that conversation, or any vendor should be interested to have that conversation rather than just walking away. Because again, you want to start with a baseline of data that you think will solve the operational challenge. You're not looking to do a laboratory exercise. So keep it simple, not only for yourself, for the vendor, but also for the success of the project. And at the end of it, there should be a proof conclusion, a results value validation, a final proposal. And frankly, if left up to me, I'm going to create the compelling event. Because I told you what I was going to do for you. Now I've shown you that I've done it. We've proven it. So I'm going to turn the machine off. And often that's a painful thing for people because, boy, do their frontline agents get really accustomed to having the insight. And for us, it's a quick motivator to say, hey, you know, we said we'd do it. We've shown you we've done it. We want to move to the transaction, stand it up, put it in production so that it's there and available to benefit your team heading forward. And then again, in six, nine months, whatever's comfortable for you, let's talk about what you want to accomplish next. Because again, it should be about what you want to do and where you want to go with your organization. So that's just a little bit about me, the company, the background, some of the use cases and success stories. But what I'd encourage you, we have just a moment. Does anyone have a question or would like to know something relative to their own organization? Go ahead. That's a great question. As a minimum baseline, you're looking for at least 18 months worth of data in your CRM. CRM will always serve as a starting point because it's where you document who's in your universe. From there, again, there's other things that you can put into it. The other thing is, is you're looking for a population. Um, we generally look for at least 25 salespeople within a sales group, whether they're SDRs, ISRs, AEs, et cetera. Uh, the reason why we do that is we want to try and use the individual agent as an attribute that we can mine against. A good example of that would be in lead scoring or opportunity scoring. If you can mine the agent as an attribute, you can then select based on who's worked with these kinds of people and is most likely to treat it to a successful closure. We can build models and drive great propensities and insights, but I like to have that extra layer of who's the best person to handle this whenever possible. Does that answer your question? OK. Anyone else? Fantastic. We're going to be outside all day. As a matter of housekeeping, I have one more item. There's a lot of drawings and giveaways. Ours should appeal to every salesperson in this room. Because whether it's for you, your best customer, or your best prospect, we're giving away a pair of greens passes to Pebble Beach. So if you haven't stopped by and met Kevin Brooks at the DX Continuum stand and dropped a business card, shame on all of us. Please do it. And uh, the drawing will be held within a week or so of the conference, and we'll be sure to contact the winner. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Really do appreciate it. Fantastic.
Fantastic. Thank you. Very good.